Um, uh, Salaam alaikum everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this kind invitation. I'm really thrilled to be here in Egypt and in Mansoura. I was actually told by many of my friends, Egyptian friends in Saudi Arabia, that this is the city of many great Egyptians. Uh, they came. They came from uh, basically the city. They're all basically scholars, scientists, and even basically great singers. In Kofina, I was I was told that she came from uh, this part. So I'm really thrilled to be here. This is my first time in Mansoura, and I'm really hoping that I'll be here uh, many many times in the future. Again, I'd like to thank the chess department, uh, Professor Shafi, and the team for giving me the privilege to be here with you today. So. I was asked to talk about treatment of acute asthma, but to concentrate on the role of inhaled steroid and how we can use inhaled steroid in patients with acute asthma. So over the coming 25, 30 minutes, I'll try to address uh, uh, this issue. So to start with, when we talk about what happened in acute asthma, we always look at acute asthma as the end result of very poorly uncontrolled asthma. So those patients, they usually have airway inflammation on board. They do have severe bronchospasm, edema, a lot of secretions. But they do have the background of airway inflammation and remodeling, which is the process, long-term process of bronchial asthma. When you look at the data coming from one of the American Institute uh, called the Multicentral Airway uh, Recreation Centers, and they looked at the behaviors of asthmatic patients in the state over a six years period from 1999 till 2001. And what they found in that survey, very interesting results, that they found that the number of patients using inhaled steroid regularly before they have an acute asthma attack was less than 50%. So that was the first one message that a lot of asthmatic they are not using their treatment regularly or competently. And the second basically important passage that the vast majority of those patients, 60, 70, 80, 90%, they had previous visit to the emergency room. Again, reflection of poor asthma control, reflecting that their poor adherence to asthma treatment. Now, when you look at what happened in asthmatic who present to the emergency room, it's important to really recognize from the first, if you like, look about how severe is this asthma attack. Because it's very important that missing asthma severity scoring can be translated on in very high mortality. And there is data on that. So proper assessment is extremely important. And usually, what we heard earlier today, that we look at certain symptoms and signs that will help us to say if this moderate asthma attack, severe asthma attack, or this is near fatal asthma attack, that will need different approach. And usually we look at uh, increased, bas basic sign of increased work of breathing. We look quickly at the hemodynamics. I'm going to say why. We did hear why before, but, but we're going to repeat on that. We use our lung function to look to assess the severity. Usually those patients who have peak expected flow rate less than 50%. Those who have rate of less than 30% are close to near fatal asthma. Low saturation. We look at arterial blood gases only on those who have more than normal severe asthma looking for high or normal CO2 level. But very important point that we keep telling our doctors and friends and our little colleagues, don't eat, look only at numbers. Look at the patient. Patients can have close to normal numbers, but they are exhausted. They're getting fatigued and tired. They're getting confused. Those patients need very urgent attention. So numbers only, they are important, but the patients in general, what we call it, patient totalis, is extremely important. And the way they look to you, even if the number is normal or acceptable to you, if they look tired and fatigued, this is a very alarming sign in acute asthma. Now, let's talk about what happened in acute asthma. And if you look at it, there's few things happen in those patients. 
first of all is the severe bronchospasm, which is differently caused by inflammation and airflow obstruction because of a smooth muscle contraction. And this kind of bronchospasm may to severe VQ mismatch and thus lead eventually to the hypoxia. But in severe cases, when there is complete obstruction of certain really part of the lungs, excessive secretion, you can even have shunt. Basically areas of lungs that can be having complete shunted and this is why the patient needs increasing dose of IFIR2. Development of interesting PEEP is extremely important in those patients and they have a positive intrathoracic pressure at the end of expiration. And let me stop here for a second. In our spontaneous breathing, when we, when we breathe, what happens at the end expiration to our alveolar pressure? It's usually equal to atmospheric pressure, so there's no flow at the end of the expiration. So normally, to start breathing, we need very minimal uh, inspiratory muscle contraction, usually the diaphragm, to create a little bit of negative pressure in the, in the alveolar to get the flow from the atmosphere into the lung. And that's usually very minimal. We don't even feel it. And the total energy used by the inspiratory muscle is less than 1% of the total body energy. Very minimal action is really required. In acute asthma, because they, they are not emptying their lungs completely, because of the airflow obstruction, at the end of the expiration, the pressure is not zero. It could be five, eight, even 10. And now, imagine that this patient would like to breathe in, so instead of dropping the alveolar basic pressure by only minus one, he now need to move to minus 11. So he need to go down all the auto peep and then go below inspiratory pressure below atmospheric pressure to initiate the breath. And this is the energy requirement. Now they are using all of the accessory muscle trying to overcome the auto peep purpose just to initiate the breath into their lungs. And of course, that will lead to increased work of really breathing and eventually, if those patients are not adequately treated, they will get to all the complication of acute asthma and basically uh, death. So looking at it, measuring of auto peep in those patients is of prime importance. So we need to understand what are we what to, what are we dealing with. It's not only give ventilin, epitropin and steroid, but we need to know what are we targeting in our treatment. And if you look at that, we are trying to improve three three things by overcoming the auto peep. We are trying to overcome the work of breathing, improvement in the cardiac output to the respiratory muscle and to other muscles, and to improve energy requirement. And let me tell you what's happening first of all on the hemodynamics. If you have increased intrathoracic pressure, your venous return is much less, right? So your cardiac output is becoming diminished on those patients. And this is why what happened at the end stage of those patients because of the increasing increase of PEEP. The instructor is becoming less and less and less, and the cardiac output become less and less and less, and then they became hypotensive. So that's extremely important. And as Dr. Apia said, cardiac output is one of the major determinants of the oxygen delivery. So you can give, doesn't matter how much oxygen you, you are giving to correct the saturation, if the cardiac output is going down, your body is hypoxic. The rest of the body is not getting that oxygen, and that's extremely important. Cerebral flow is very important because if you have a lot of auto peep, your venous return not only from the leg will be less, from the brain will be less. So the brain will be congested, increase intracranial pressure. And we know that if you look at the cerebral pressure, that's what people do in the ICU measurements basically sometimes to check the cerebral perfusion pressure, which is the mean pressure minus intracranial pressure. And if you have less venous return, your intracranial pressure is very high, so the cerebral perfusion becomes less. And this is why those patients become agitated, obtunded, and at the end of stage, they get to coma. 
So knowing all of these pathophysiology that happen in acute asthma, our target of therapy is trying to address these points. And when we look at it, to simplify our target of therapy is to maintain oxygenation, maintain hemodynamic, to maintain basically oxygen delivery, and to treat the bronchospasm and to decrease the, the auto-peep that happened in those patients. And to do that, we use two medications. I put them in that order, anti-inflammatory and bronchodilator. Although what we are doing in real life, we are using bronchodilator first, dilator, and then anti-inflammatory. But I just would like to remind myself and remind you that it is the inflammation is the problem. The bronchospasm is a reflection of the inflammation. It's not an basically spontaneous things happening. Of course, whenever we, we are treating those patients, we would like to recognize any sudden complication, usually pneumothorax or bilateral trauma, sometimes severe hypertension, spontaneous respiratory arrest that can happen in those patients, very important. And then eventually, we would like to prevent the relapse. I'm, I'm treating this attack, but I'm keeping in my mind that I'd like to prevent this from happening next time. So we are using for the bronchodilators, we are using beta-2 agonist, we are using epitropium, uh, anticholinergic, beta on magnesium sulfate, and theophyllin sometimes, we don't talk about that. And on the anti-inflammatory treatment, steroids are the cornerstone of treatment in chronic asthma, but also in acute asthma. A few words on the beta-2 agonist as a bronchodilator, it is definitely the cornerstone of bronchodilators. And the message is that you should give as much as you can, especially if, if you're dealing with severe acute asthma or life-threatening asthma. And the message is the only limiting factor is not the dose, it is the side effect. So the more you give, the better. And there is two messages that we learn from, from the literature that we give in the first hour is extremely important, and nowadays people are giving either continuous ventilin for one hour and then, uh, and then re-evaluate, or giving ventilin Q20 minutes or Q15 minutes for two, three times and then re-evaluate. But the message here that give adequate ventilin. Don't shy from ventilin. And the important part, it's not the dose which is important. So don't increase the dose if you want to increase the frequency. Because now we know that if you stimulate 20-30% of the beta receptors in the lung, that will give you maximum bronchodilatation. So giving higher dose of 2.5 to 5 milligram, if you give 10 milligram to 50 milligram, that will only increase side effect. It has no potential add-on benefit. But if you want to do things, increase frequency from every one hour to every 20 minutes or even continuous, if you like. In milder form in bronchiasma, you can use the NDI with a spacer and this data that in moderate asthma attack, this is equivalent to the basically nebulizer. However, most physicians, as I know, and I'm not sure how you do here, when you have acute severe asthma, we go ahead and use the nebulized basically treatment. What about epitropium bromide, which is used? And there are a lot of debates about this, whether it's really add anything. But there is no data that in those who have severe asthma, not a moderate asthma, if you look at the moderate asthma patient, really the improvement in hospitalization was not there. But it only improved the rate of hospital admission in severe asthma, and there was significant improvement if you have acute severe asthma. So we do use it when we have acute severe asthma. In my hospital, we don't use it routinely in mild or moderate asthma attack. IV magnesium, if you look at the guidelines, it's been now used in acute severe asthma as well, and the data is recommending using it only once, two to four gram of magnesium sulfate over slow intravenous infusion. There is no data to say that you should repeat, basically, this dose. There is no safety data to say that it's safe to repeat the dosing. And if you look at it, data has shown that after about two hours, there was significant improvement in the FEV1 in those patients who received uh, magnesium versus those who did not receive. And again, if you look at it, the data was very convincing only in severe asthma. It was not very helpful in moderate asthma attack. So 
in the data that uh, this therapy should be used as single dose of intravenous magnesium in patients who have severe acute asthma attack. Now let's shift gear to the steroid treatment. And this is what I keep saying to me when I talk with my uh, really colleague, I said no patients come to the emergency and go on without steroid. Because we do see patients coming and getting and sent home. Just been and sent home. And, and you know what's going to happen. A few hours later, he will come again um, without an attack. So everybody comes to the acute attack, they require steroid treatment. And the steroid can be given in form. It can be given as a systemic dose. And that's the usual treatment. We give one milligram per kg, five milligram per kg, and all people use IV. So 40 milligrams per day, and you found that if you look at the end of the day, of the day one and the end of the day two, there was very comparable results in the improvement in the lung function. However, when we look at the symptoms score at day one and day two, when we look at the reason, for example, we can look at the wheeze was much better or faster improved when we use nebulizer steroid versus the systemic steroid. The shortness of breath was better on day one, but it was equivalent in day two. So the best, what you can get out of this study, that at the end of the day two, both drugs will give you very equivalent improvement in the lung function and the difficulty in breathing, but nebulizer steroid will give you faster. At the end of day one, there was significant faster improvement in the symptoms and the lung function than the systemic steroid. And this was a Canadian study done by Mark Fitzgerald, uh, again about uh, 10 years ago. And what he was trying to say, the effect of nebulized steroid versus oral steroid and the effect of exacerbation and relapse. And he had a patient who were treated in the emergency room, they felt better, and the FED1 was more than 50%, and he decided to send them home. And then he randomized them into two arms, those who received bedicinide as a nebulization, two milligram Q8 hourly, versus prednisolone, 40 milligram a day. And he followed them for 10 days. What he found in his paper, that there was no significant difference in the exacerbation rate if 
you use oral steroid for 10 days or nebulize basically polymer for 10 days, the effect on exacerbation or the relapse was the same. So that indicate that the nebulized steroid was as effective in this paper as systemic steroid in improving the relapse. Another study looking at what happened if I add on nebulized steroid to the oral steroid. Would that get, get me any add-on benefit? And this was again a three weeks study where we had a patient on prednisolone 50 mg a day for seven days in both arms, but one arm received as an add-on nebulized steroid, basically the pulmonary cord nebulization, uh, two mg every eight hours or a placebo. And we followed them for three weeks. When we found that, when you look at the relapse rate, there was significantly about 50% improvement in the relapse rate in those who received a combination of systemic steroid and nebulized polymicord than those who were only using uh, systemic steroid. And when you look at the use of beta 2 agonists as a surrogate marker for asthma control, again, those who were using the polymicord with the systemic steroid, they use far less amount of ventilin as a rescue treatment compared to those patients who use only systemic steroid. And the question is, why this is happening? Why if you are using nebulizer steroid, you are getting better results than using steroid alone? An equivalent result, at least in some of this basically data, compared to the systemic steroid. And there is two theories here when we look at it. Number one, is that when you use inhaled steroid, the steroid reach a very high level in the lungs in very few minutes. You can see here, in two minutes, it peaks when you use the nebulized steroid. So you start the anti-inflammatory effect very significantly. And the concentration in the lung is much high. So it's not only it reached there quickly, the concentration stayed there for a long time. Well, if you use, for example, the oral steroid, even after 10 minutes, you did not get even high, basically half of this dose. It takes you f two to four hours to reach that dose. If you use intravenous, you need about three times longer duration. So the first, the first probably mechanism is the concentration that reaches the airways is extremely high, and that reach very, very high. And when you look at the inflammatory or anti-inflammatory activity of those nebulized steroid in acute asthma in a pediatric patient. This was about 18 patients, and look what happened to the nitric oxide in the lungs. Again, as a reflection of suppression of the inflammation, all patients, they have very significant drop in the nitric oxide level, the, the exhaled nitric oxide level, only a few minutes after using the nebulized, basically, polymer core. So it seemed that this early delivery to the airways with very high concentration make a lot of difference in improving uh, the potential efficacy of the drug in treating those patients. Now, it's important to realize that we are getting all of this benefit with the probably keeping the safety margin at the higher level. For example, if you look at what happened to the steroid concentration in the airways versus the systemic concentration, those who used the nebulized steroid, they have very high level of steroid in the airways, but very low level in the blood. While if you are giving systemic steroid, eventually you are getting the level in the airways, but also you get very systemic steroid effect in the blood. And of course, that will reflect to worse side effect, especially if those patients who require higher dose or longer, or basically longer duration. And the data shown here that even after two weeks of using very high dose of nebulized steroid, you can look at what happened in the basal cortisol level in the blood. It did not change from the baseline. This was the baseline data. And after uh, 12 weeks, three months of nebulized steroid, even using uh, two milligrams every eight hours, the cortisol level in the blood did not go down, and not only that, the adrenal, when it was tested, it was quite active. So there was no adrenal gland uh, suppression 
by two to three weeks or even longer duration of using liberalized, basically, polymer coat, not only in the emergency room, but even as a follow-up period after we discharge those patients from the hospital. So what other modality that we do have, apart from the bronchodilator, um, steroids, and there is one thing that we use very rarely in my hospital, we use what we call novel treatment, is using basically heliox. And the heliox is basically a gas which is having lower density than nitrogen. So what are we breathing is oxygen and nitrogen. That's, that's basically the air uh, that we are breathing now. While the hyalux is simply oxygen and helium. And, and the reason this will be of really add on benefit, that nitrogen is a gas. Okay, I keep challenging my basically doctor and saying, why do we need nitrogen? Why God created a lot of nitrogen in the air? that we don't even talk about, right? And we, we really hear Dr. Atiyah giving us brilliant talk uh, about, uh, about really ventilation, talking about CO2 and oxygen. But none of us talk about nitrogen. Although it is the most abundant gas around us. So, so why there is nitrogen? Do you know? Did you, did you ever think about it? Why there is nitrogen? It doesn't burn. It doesn't burn? Okay, right, so anyhow, nitrogen is very static gas. It stayed in the airways as a stent. What happens if you give somebody 100% oxygen? Absorbed quickly and there will be, there will be atelectasis. So nitrogen is the gas that stayed in the airways and keep it patent. So this is why we don't like to give 100% oxygen, of course, beside the toxicity, because it will absorb quickly and give you atelectasis. Anyhow, this nitrogen is very thick gas, if you like. And the way it moves in the airways, it, it, it moves in a very turbulent way. While helium is very thinner gas, so it goes as a laminar flow. So it improves the flow even if you have narrower airways. So the idea was, let's replace nitrogen by helium in order to deliver the oxygen into the distal organ. And the data has shown that it does work. Yes, you can improve the, basically the oxygen delivery to the distal organ by giving a helium versus nitrogen. And when you look at what happened to the lung function, it improved the real significantly with helium. The only problem with the helium is that you cannot give a lot of oxygen. Because if you give 70% oxygen and now the helium is basically only 30%, the idea of having the helium is really gone. So you are limited, if, you, if the patient is really hypoxic, you cannot use this helix strategy. I will not talk about mechanical ventilation, but I will give us a brilliant talk about it. And, and this what I'll tell you that I would like to recommend just a few lines. The decision of intubating asthmatic is very critical. As we heard from the previous talk, it should not be taken lightly. All effort should be done to avoid intubating asthmatic. Having said that, do not hesitate to, uh, to intubate when it's necessary to do that. And that's now become the difficulty. There's, I'm not sure if I or Dr. Atiyah or anybody can tell you what is that gut feeling that the expert people will have to say, this is the time to intubate. It's not simply the oxygenation, not simply the CO2. We do see patients came with high CO2 with, access, with aggressive treatment, they really improved. But to me, and there's one thing that makes me very worried, is slow mentation or fatigued. If the patient is getting fatigued, tired, even if his oxygen is okay and CO2 is low, I'm very worried. And I keep my ICU friends around and alert, because this is the time probably that they should interfere. But the message here, do not intubate early, but do not intubate late, because every minute here counts in those patients. And we did hear about, about all of these things, that, that you would like to avoid certain drugs, you would like to avoid, um, as, we, as we said, irritating the airways and then really expert anesthetists to come ahead and really intubate the patient quickly. I need to be very careful. 
Are the flow support is not supported by data. There is no data to show that flow support is needed in those patients. However, if they become hypotensive, then that's one thing that we all do. Our strategy, that's basically our strategy in the hospital, we use low tidal volume, we use low, basically very slow respiratory rate, we go as low as six sometimes, we allow for the permits of hypercapnia, we apply PEEP one way to overcome the auto PEEP as well, a lot of bronchodilator and a lot of steroid, we sedate and paralyze most of those patients, and we always wait for the complication. The worst case scenario I had is the patient who ended with six chest tube, three tubes in both sides, because we could not ventilate him. Even the underbagging, you cannot underbag him because he had very severe, so you have to really paralyze them, sedate them badly. You need to push pressure in, and you get all the complications sometimes. So really, those asthmatic can be a nightmare. This is our Saudi guideline. We do have our, our Saudi guideline, and this is how we published our data a few years ago. We assess patients uh, based on their clinical features, lung function, and, ox and the oxygenation. We would like to be sure that they have adequate oxygenation, and we use the number of 92% as a reasonable oxygenation for those patients. By the way, we do not need to over oxygenate them. There is data that if you give them too much oxygen unnecessarily, that probably will have basically negative impact on them, I think because of the increased atelectasis. Uh, Salbutamol should be given freely and very rapidly. Inhaled steroid, we talk about all steroid, but we did emphasize that patient with moderate asthma or above should have nebulized steroid uh, as treatment. We believe that there is enough data to support that nebulized steroid should be used in acute severe asthma. As we told you that there is data to show that it's faster in the recovery, it might decrease the exacerbation rate and relapse rate in those patients. So we use it in all patients who came with moderate or severe acute asthma to our emergency department. We add on therapy depending on, we use epitropium in those who have severe asthma and magnesium. We do not use theophyllin. We think that the data of theophyllin is really obsolete. This drug is dangerous. Having said that, I do respect some expert physicians saying that it could be life-saving in those who, who have near fatal asthma, but there is no data whatsoever to show that theophyllin is a drug that should be used in acute asthma. Actually, there is data to show that it increases mortality because of the arrhythmia in those patients. Uh, and all those ICU teams should be on board. Uh, the collaboration between emergency team respirologists and the ICU team are very necessary in treating acute severe asthmatic patient. So in summary, early assessment is very important. Aggressive treatment with a steroid, and again emphasizing that we believe that there is enough data to show that both systemic and nebulized steroid should be used in acute asthma. Um, uh, of, of course, bronchodilators should be used, and this is very nice say, I really, and I think it, it makes a lot of sense. The best treatment for acute asthma attack is a few days before its occurrence. Don't wait until it's really happened. Treat asthma adequately, uh, and don't allow exacerbation to happen. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Professor Ronaldo Gris, for this elegant uh, presentation. Uh, and I think it was um, uh, I mean, uh, the money end for this uh, day, which is the Primary Critical Care Day. Uh, thank you for your attendance. Uh, thank you for your patience. And um, uh, there is a question. Question, please. Yes. I will ask the uh, question. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ali, uh, you have said that uh, if it is all ICS, uh, can be used in acute severe asthma, but, uh, all, but only bisphenide. I can uh, use any advice or that it must be nebulized. Um, I think ICS is a class group. If you have a nebulized bisphenide, fritixone, both can be used. In my hospital, we have both. We have more experience with bisphenide because it's been in our hospital for about six years now. The fritixone is only recently uh, basically available. So it depends on what you have. I was told that in Egypt you have only bisphenide, right? I don't. Okay. So I, I have another device.
Well, if you look at the data, they looked at really, really high doses. So we look at they need basically two grams Q, QID, uh, two milligram QID, or four milligram QID. If you want to use NDI or reach the halo with somebody who's having very bad asthma, I think it's going to be difficult. So what we what, what we recommend is to use really basically middle eye because you need to really reach very high dose and concentration in the airways, mm -hmm. and by that we need to use middle eye. Well. Any question? Um, and despite um, asthma, uh, only can diagnose, but um, not all can control it. In spite of many medications which are available in our hands, but still the problem of uncontrolled asthma we have. But um, uh, uh, the message here, not to need an asthmatic patient, need mechanical ventilation. Not to an asthmatic patient, need ICU, obviously, and not need an you know, asthmatic patient, need mechanical ventilation, because um, it is very difficult to ventilate an asthmatic patient in spite of the virus, very good for those compared for any other diseases. But your, your, your issue here, uh, control your patient by using the any means, especially using of corticosteroid, and no need for what's called the corticosteroid formula that we have in our practice in the in, 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 in real situation. Uh, uh, at the end of this day, thank you for all. Uh, now um, the time for uh, lunch and the certificate, and we will um, uh, call you in other events by using your emails. وانا يعني في النهايه بشكر كل الزملاء اللي شاركونا وبشكر شركه استرازينكا فور اتس هيلب وبشكر تشريف حضراتكم جميعا دكتور محمد عطيه الاخ فاضل دكتور مجدي ريس وزملاء جميعا ونرجو لقاءكم ان شاء الله في كل خير سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك شكرا لكم ان شاء الله باذن الله على فكره الناس اللي عند الشهادات بتاعتهم مش بتاع افيلابل يعني they did get registration and will be available in the department by the end of the coming week and by the way the DVD also will be available in our department a week later. Inshallah. Inshallah.